Good morning and welcome to Solid Ground Church. My name is Ryan and it's my privilege to welcome you to church this morning. This morning is Easter and we want to join with the church around the world in saying, He is risen. He is risen indeed. What a powerful truth. Well, this morning, it is our heart for this to be a conversation. And so we wanna hear from you and we know that it is always somebody's first Sunday. And so whether this is your first Sunday or whether you call this place home, we wanna hear from you. And so we'd love to hear your prayer requests, your questions, or even your stories of what God is doing in your life this week. And so make sure to send us those and interact with us on sgbic.com. That's our one-stop shop where you can learn more about what's going on around here. And we do have some exciting things coming, whether it's Discover SG for new people, a new members meeting, or even tacos coming April 30th. We want you to be involved and we want to hear from you. And so make sure to check out our website where you can learn more and stay up to date on all the things happening around here. Well, in just a moment, the worship team is gonna lead us in some awesome worship songs, and then Pastor Mike has an amazing message straight from the Father's heart, and we'd love for you to stick around and just be a part of this together. Well, as we get started this morning, I wanna share a story with you. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had one of our missionaries here, Tim and Sharon Maxwell, and they work with Multiplication Network Ministries, planning churches around the world and it's so amazing to see what God is doing. Last year alone, they planted 6,000 churches through local leaders trained and raised up to do God's work around the world. And you are a part of that. But then we also got to hear the story of what God is doing specifically through Tim and Sharon in their journey as Tim has been battling cancer. And thank you guys so much for all of your prayers for them. No matter whether it is in prayer or financial support, you are investing in what God is doing here and around the world. And so we just want to say a big thank you for your generosity. So as we begin, let me start with a word of prayer, praying over our tithes and offerings and just being a part of what God is doing. Let's pray. Father God, we come this morning and we give you this place. We give you our time, we give you our hearts, and we enter into worship and we say thank you. Thank you for your grace, which is new every morning because you are risen. You are risen indeed. And, and we just come to celebrate Easter morning and we come to celebrate what you are doing. Would you speak to us this morning and may we take this time to worship you. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. short I've got nothing new How could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do But every song must end and you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I'm nothing else fit for
Happy Easter, everybody. I am so glad that you are here with us, whether it's your first time or whether you've been with us for a long time. Whether you feel like you are strong in your faith or maybe you just wound up here by accident, well, maybe that's what you think. I don't think anyone is here by accident today. And I'm so glad that we get to spend a few minutes going over this passage together. So let's start out in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 through 43. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, they killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's a very simple sermon that Peter wrote. And I have the feeling that Peter sensed in this moment that something special is happening, that something special was happening to him. Have you ever had that kind of feeling like this moment is significant? I think as he's with these folks in Cornelius' house, who, uh, who were all together through a, a supernatural circumstance, Peter starts reflecting on the past few years of his life, how he was called, in spite of being a fisherman, to follow this rabbi named Jesus. And they traveled around the Judean countryside for, for three years I'm sure he was reflecting and he even preached, he, he was sharing about how he knew Jesus was crucified. Those days where he ran and denied Jesus and how he was restored by Jesus after the resurrection and how they waited around for 40 days after Jesus' ascension, wondering what's going to happen and how the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and how they went from a group of apostles and 120 believers to almost in a moment, 3,000 believers in this gathering of people. And then reflecting on how in the world he got in this room sharing his experience with Jesus. He's in a, a like I mentioned before, he's in the house of Cornelius, a, a Roman centurion from the province of Italy. And the text says that he was a person who feared God he, he knew there was something about this Jewish God and he would give to the poor and he did good things. And he saw a vision of an angel saying, go and find this guy, Peter. Send some people to Simon the Tanner's house. And at the same time, Peter saw a vision that expanded his, his view of what God was up to uh, in a tangible way. He saw that, that God wasn't just there to redeem the Jewish people, but a reminder that, that God's plans included all of humanity and said, there's gonna be someone who brings you to Cornelius' house. And right then, knock on the door, kind of like that moment in the Matrix where Neo gets that message, follow the white rabbit, and then the lady with the, the white rabbit tattoo shows up on his door. I'm dating myself with the reference, but um, this is like, what just happened? And here, Peter's in a room full of Gentiles. And that didn't happen. That's not kosher. I mean that literally. <laughs> like it, it, That didn't happen in a first century Jew to be with his Roman oppressors and Gentiles on top of that. And then Peter shares what he had been through. 
And what he shared about, well, the fancy name for it is a kerygma. That's just a, a Greek word that they teach you in seminary, and it means what we preach about Jesus. And it was a simple sermon. If you were paying attention, if you go back in the, in the notes on version, you can see in the text that it has four points. First point, God sent Jesus to do good. He was healing people. He set captives free. Peter says, we saw it. Like these witnesses, they killed him. The Rome and the, and the Jewish leaders, they hung Jesus on a cross and he died and God raised him. We saw it with our own eyes. Point number three is now he's the one, the one who's putting all of this mess back together, not just reforming the Jewish religion, but pointing to what all that was, was, was about, but also the brokenness in this world. He's at work. He's the one. And the fourth point was everyone who trusts him receives forgiveness of sins. Simple sermon. So simple. No funny intro, no poem, no video that pops into the screen, but it was powerful. The text goes on to say in verse 44 that while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. So uh, in Acts chapter 2, we saw that, that the Spirit fell there in, this, in the upper room and, uh, and emboldened the apostles to preach the gospel. They were speaking in other languages that they had never learned. Uh, the, and filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter preached the sermon and there were tons of converts to the way of Jesus. And now we see in this room that the Holy Spirit is going out even further into the Gentile sphere. How did that message make that happen? It makes no sense for a couple reasons because it's a simple message, but it's so specific. Peter's talking about one guy from a little place. How could someone in that, in that culture, people would say, how could someone from there do something significant? But also, not only is it specific, it's universal. universal. How could one guy from Judea affect the whole planet? <laughs> And now as we're looking back on this text, it could, we could say, how could one guy from the middle of nowhere in the Roman Empire do something that changed human history? It reminds me of the story of a, of a Portuguese aristocrat who, before he died, he decided he was going to give away all of his wealth. And he picked 70 random people out of a phone book. Remember phone books? who are amazing, they were free, and they just showed up on your door. And he picks out 70 people from the phone book and told his lawyers, I want these people to receive an inheritance when I die. Can you imagine getting that phone call? <laughs> it sounds like some emails I've received in my inbox before. Like, no, 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 no. And, and that is how it played out. The people didn't believe it when they got a call from the lawyer. You've received an inheritance. You've done nothing to deserve it. But someone chose you to receive this great, great gift. That's kind of like Jesus. But Jesus didn't just pick out 70 random people. J Jesus says anyone who believes in him, anyone who confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart that he is Lord, they receive the benefits. And I also want to point out in this passage, because it talks about the Jews killing Jesus, Jesus even names the, the people who killed him as the beneficiaries. Is he saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Everyone has access. Not everyone takes advantage of the, the free gift. It's called free, it just costs you your whole life. But everyone has access to the redemption every, uh, provided by Jesus, and everyone has access to a relationship with the living God because of what Jesus did. So there's a couple things that don't make sense. It's so specific, the message that Peter uh, gave them, and it's, it's so universal, but at the same time, it makes perfect sense. The world was broken, and God intervened. Something needed to be done. And I love that, I love, and I'm also uncomfortable with the last part of Jesus' message, because it talks about a dirty little word in 2023 that we don't like talking about. 
Three letter word, S I N. I love, I love my recovering Baptist friends that go to solid ground and that I, that I meet with. And sometimes they say, Mike, you don't talk about sin enough. And I know, I know, I know. And it's, it's not that I take sin lightly. I take what Jesus said about sin seriously. And, uh, and, and I do think it's important that we talk about sin. It is. But some people would say, that's just an antiquated term. All that carries with it, it carries this baggage, that word sin. It just goes back to shame-based, abusive religions. It's not kosher to talk about sin these days because for some, sin is questioning or challenging people's self-expression. And some people prefer to only talk about sin in terms of, of what institutions do. Or other people think that teaching about sin is the same thing as calling human beings horrible creatures. And still, for others, sin... For them, it borders on hate speech or bullying. And some those people want to retire the concept of sin and instead tell people that they're just perfect as they are and that they can do anything that they want to do. Wow. I feel that tension. But as I, as I look in the text, I see that sin is, yes, it's things that we do that are wrong. It's things that we know we're supposed to do and we don't do them. But it's also the condition that we live in. There's a really interesting theologian named John Dixon. And any theologian that started out as the lead singer of a rock band automatically gets my attention. But he has this history of Christianity called Bullies and Saints. And I came across this quote, and it's kind of long, but I want to read it to you because it, it has some interesting stuff in here for our conversation. It goes like this. I had an interesting conversation with a journalist from Australia's national broadcaster. He told me he liked some of the ethical teachings of Jesus, the bits about love and peace, but he was deeply weary of talk about human guilt and divine mercy. He worried this could crush the human spirit, especially in children. They would grow up, he feared, in a cloud of guilt that obstructed their abilities and intrinsic value. He preferred the notion that we all have within us everything we need to live honorable lives. I explained that I think the shoe lies on the other foot. Imagine growing up in a family where the expectation is that you are good through and through. You'll make the starting lineup, you'll always stay out of trouble, you'll always get straight A's at school and quickly repair any personal failures. I suggested that this was the recipe for crushing a child's spirit. Such a performance-based mentality is tied to achievement. That cannot prepare us for the inevitable failures of life. Much better, it seems to me, is to raise our children in the full knowledge of their gifts and their flaws, and the knowledge that they are loved regardless of their performance. Christ did not teach us that we are hopeless failures destined to be immoral, but he did insist that recognizing our flawed humanity is the first step towards seeking his kingdom. Adopting this outlook is like growing up in a family that simultaneously has high hopes for you. Who could deny Christ's high hopes for Christians? But a family that also trains you to acknowledge your faults and trust that your membership in the family depends on love, not on achievement. That challenged me because I'm a dad and I'm training my kids and I want them to know that, that they are loved and there is goodness at them. And at the same time, I live with them. I know that, that they're not going to be perfect all the time. I think that uh, we need to rebrand sin one way, it's especially if you're here from outside the Christian faith. When we talk about sin, one way we can talk about it is the human propensity to mess things up. I think we can all agree, if we're honest, we can mess things up. And as we look out at the world, we see uh, everyone has the capacity within them to mess things up. So let's, let's tie some of these things together. Peter's preaching 
to Cornelius' household. And in that quote from, from John Dixon that I just wrote, it goes, that I just read, it goes along with our human experience. We have good instincts. We also have the capacity for hurting others. We have the capacity for hurting ourselves. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy and we can't get out of our own way. So Cornelius had these questions. Who is this Jewish God? I've heard about Jesus. What's that all about? And God sent Peter. Everybody has questions about this dynamic, even if they don't name it the same way. The author Daryl Johnson kind of summed up nine questions that everybody from like all the major world religions, they have these nine questions. What is reality? What is really real? And number two is who or what are we? What does it mean to be a human being? Number three, is there such a thing as morality? Is there a right and wrong? If so, what's the basis? What's the compass for that? And how does one know what is good or bad? What's the meaning of history? Or is there any meaning? Who or what is wrong with us? Like something's off. <laughs> what is it? Is there a solution to that? Can things be fixed? Who can fix it? How can they fix it? How quickly can they fix it? Most people ask, is there a God? And if so, can this God be trusted? And is God involved in the human world, especially when it comes to human suffering? What happens to us after death? Is, is this all there is? And I like this question, this ninth question, this last one. What time is it? The scripture tells us that there's a appointed time for everything and there is a time for every event under the sun. So where are we in the flow of history? You know, Jesus answers all these questions through his teachings and through his examples. And I've learned some helpful language from my Anglican buddies. They go through this thing called catechism that trains them in the, in the basics of the faith. And I think some of their language can help us tie this conversation together between the big questions that we all ask and then the answers that Jesus provides. So that, you know, what, what is reality and what is the human condition is such a big question. I mean, that covers all of human history, really. All the people alive at one point or another trying to make sense like of what happened. So think about this. Though created good and made for fellowship with our creator, humanity has been cut off from God by self-centered rebellion against him, leading to lawless living, guilt, shame, and death in the fear of judgment. This is the state of sin. This is our experience. People have goodness in them, but we see that when we make ourselves the star of the big story, it causes us to fly way out of the orbit we were meant for. Like I said, look at the news, the wars of our world. People are capable of monstrous acts. People break promises. You and I, if we're honest, we break promises. People walk around with feelings of guilt and toxic shame. There's like a good kind of guilt or conviction that causes you to come clean, that causes you to make a change. But then there's the toxic shame that, that makes you rehearse negative things about yourself in your mind. I always do this, I'm dirty. I can never change. We're broken. Some of us have secret lives or secret search histories that if they were to come out, they would ruin us. We see, like I've mentioned before, broken institutions, businesses, churches, um, things that are supposed to bring good into the world wind up doing harm sometimes. We live in a world where there's racism. We live in a world where there's adultery, confusion about our identity. And we've seen, especially in the past few years, the destructive the destructive things that can happen when people hold on to a posture of tribalism, us against them. There's a song that says, the fall, the fall. Oh God, the fall of man, 
The fruit is found in every eye, and every hand, and in every hand there is nothing left. In truest form, we walk like ghosts upon the earth. The ground, it groans. How long? This isn't just a theory on sin. Like, sin is real. And this is where we need the gospel of Jesus. This is where we need the good news of Jesus in real life. Because my, my hunch is those big nine questions that we ask, we don't always articulate them that way. I don't. Usually I articulate them in, how can I put one foot in front of the other before I have this hard conversation? I messed up again. How do I make amends? Oh my goodness, I'm so tired. Is, is what I'm doing making a difference in this life? I need the good news that I have help in this life, that Jesus defeated sin, defeated depression, anxiety, sadness, that God created something out of nothing, that we live in a world of abundance. That is where the good news happens in real life. We've been talking about this sin word. You know, my friends ask, how does sin affect you? And in the, the typical answer that they've given me is that sin alienates me from God, my neighbor, God's good creation, and myself. Apart from Christ, I am hopeless, guilty, lost, helpless, and walking in the way of death. Sin alienates us. It alienates us from people, and it alienates us from God, and it, it can can look like having a bad interaction. Maybe you've sinned against your neighbor in your neighborhood, like literally the person next door to you. And no matter who was the offending party, maybe you both had something to do with it. It alienates you. It causes people to perfectly time their garage door opener, to open just so you can get in the house soon enough and close it as soon as so you don't have to talk to that neighbor that said that thing that you'll never forget. Sin alienates us from our families. How many families have grudges right now? Maybe you're holding a grudge against somebody because they did something, or or maybe you've done something to your family and you feel like, I don't know how to fix it. It's the effect of sin. This happens even in church families. I used to be a part of churches with multiple church services, and I knew of people going, ooh, I'm going to go to first service because I don't want to see brother so-and-so or brother or sister so-and-so in second service. It alienates even people in the same church. This alienation, it leads to the way of death. So I'm, I'm liberally borrowing from the Anglican tradition, but there's some good stuff in here. They say, what is this way of death? So it's a trust in things that can't save us. It's it, when we put our trust in our bank account, that leads to the way of death because that's not, a, as we've seen recently, even that some banks can't be trusted. If your trust is in your abilities, in your material possessions, or your accomplishments, or your reputation, that's a very risky place to put your trust. That path leads to death. It reminds me of... The children of Israel, when they were in bondage in Egypt, they were told to make bricks without straw. That's what it's like to put your trust in things that can't save you. That's what it's like trying to ever tried to be good on your own. I'm just going to read another self-help book and I'm going to pull myself up by the bootstraps and I'm going to fix this. In my experience, it's far more helpful to have brothers and sisters around me that I can be real with. They've earned the right to hear my story. They've earned the right to to see my flaws and my mistakes and ask them to pray for me. I've experienced so much more life admitting to God, I need your help with this. I'm like, I'm struggling with patience. God, I don't have it in me. You've got to help me be patient right now or whatever it is. Trying to do good on your own You can white knuckle it for a little while, but human willpower, it's a finite resource. 
But when we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we have access to all the fruits of the Spirit, to all the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That comes from outward. If I only look to myself to, to solve my problems and to fix my messes, I don't have as many tools as I need. So fourth, like I just said, do you have the power to save yourself from sin and death? I would say no. We don't have the power to save ourselves as humanity. Only God can save us. We've got thousands of years of human history to draw upon to, to look back and I think you can, you can um, just objectively say, we can't save ourselves on our own. You know, most, a lo- most of the problems we face today are generations before us, their solutions to those problems. And the pendulum swings back and forth. But here, in Peter's very simple message, he's saying, God sent the one to have a different kingdom and it's right under our noses. But we still live in a world of sin. Um, and, and it's already here, but, but not quite yet. Even another biblical writer, Paul, he said, I do the things I don't want to do. And then there's things that I know I should do and I don't do them. We need help. Even the writers of the Bible, the people God inspired to write the Bible, even they need help. Have you ever done something, either just sinful or, or just plain stupid, and had somebody say, what were you thinking? And you say, I don't know. That's an honest answer. <laughs> Because when we're doing things on our own, sometimes we don't even know why we did it. Maybe there's some of you, as I'm going through some of the wisdom from church traditions uh, that, of, of generations that have come before us, maybe, and I'm going through Peter's sermon, maybe some of you are saying, ah, I used to believe that, but, but I just don't believe that anymore. As you, as you look at as you look around at how the world is today, as you look at the pain in your own life, you've got to admit, something's off. Something happened. And the the Bible tells us that that Genesis chapter three, like humans have chosen their own way. And now, as hard as we try, we can't close Pandora's box. That's where the good news comes in. Jesus came to bring forgiveness, restoration, and life. Now that's possible, and that's good news. It's good news because even though we ran away from God, the scripture tells us, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God loves all of this, and God loves you right where you are. Even after everything you and I have done, forgiveness is possible. Even after everything you and I have done and and all the big bad institutions and empires and everything, salvation is still possible. And how does God save you? God forgives your sin and mine through Jesus. We don't have to do anything. It has been done for us. Our role is to trust in Jesus and follow him. We need this. We need a way to deal with our guilt and shame. We need a way to find hope in a hopeless world. But why would God do this? Don't tune this out. I know Easter, you're thinking, okay, we're going to talk about the resurrection. I totally get that. But don't let this become so familiar that it becomes unfamiliar to you, especially if you've been around here a while. Why does God save you? Because you are loved. God saves you because God loves you. What if we wrote that all over on sticky notes or something all over our house? Because God loves me, he intervened. You could play around with it. Because God loves us, God intervened. Because God loves the world, Jesus intervened. So I mentioned that word, Kerygma, what we teach about Jesus. 
And I know throughout church history, the charisma of the church has often declined into moralism or behavior modification or a dress code. But this simple message of Jesus, maybe sometimes for you it feels like it's turned into a 2,000 year old game of telephone. Remember, <laughs> the message declines throughout the years. Maybe in some communities it's changed over the years. Even Jesus followers mess things up from time to time. But that theologian, John Dixon, he also says that in every generation, there's a self-correcting instinct within Christianity and eventually it kicks in. There's something called a remnant. That's a group of people that, that God preserves. And I think that's when we are now. I think that's where we are now. God is preserving and refining this group of people that want to follow the pure and simple message of Jesus. This message that we celebrate at Easter time. Christ did die for our sin and our shame, but he's also alive. You know, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I love that and it gives me so much hope. But did you know that Jesus talked a lot more about living in this life than he ever talked about eternity. When you give your heart to Jesus, do you go to heaven when you die? Absolutely. But don't skip this part. Don't miss out on this part. Because Jesus is living, it means that this life counts. This isn't a do-over. This isn't, this isn't waiting in a long version of the DMV. If you work at the DMV, I don't mean to, uh, to offend you. <laughs> Whatever long line you don't like, this life isn't just a, a waiting room. God wants to bring you life now, to set you free now, to help you live in freedom now. That's so easy to tune out if we think we've heard it all. It's so easy to tune out if you think, oh, all of this stuff that, that Christianity stuff, it's just a crutch. Gotta remind you that Peter saw this stuff with his own eyes. If this was just made up, why would all of the apostles except for one have died a gruesome, painful death for something they knew was a conspiracy? Maybe you're in a spot where you're like, oh, I just don't know if I can make that leap to believe. I'd encourage you to draw on their belief and say, and take one step, like maybe your first step towards this life Jesus offers is saying, maybe there's something to this. If, if the story of Peter is true and that he was martyred for this simple message, maybe there's something to it. If the story of Thomas traveling to the southern tip of India from Jerusalem and giving his life for Jesus, because he was preaching the gospel message. People don't just do that on a whim. No, that's about as far away as you could get from Jerusalem in the first century. Maybe the first step for you is to say, maybe there's something to that. Or for those of us, maybe our hearts, we've been around a while, maybe our hearts have grown a little hard to this. Maybe our hearts have got some scars on them from, from the things we've been through the past few years. For us, the challenge is to return to that simple message of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. To trust that, that in this life right here and now, like it says in the book of Colossians, that he is holding all of this together. He's holding the galaxies together. He's holding the atoms that make up our body together that Christ can hold your family together, that Christ can hold your neighborhood together, your office together. If you're looking for those answers, if you're looking for who's gonna fix all this, Jesus is the place to look. I want us to, to try something very simple today. It's just to repent, 
What sins do we have? What ways are we running away from Jesus? What ways are we trying to do it on our own? If you're new to this or coming back to this, today, will you hear Jesus' words to you saying, I want to save you because I love you. Your challenge today is to believe. And I want to challenge you, us all, is a affirmation of our faith, of a maybe a reaffirmation of our faith, that today, at some point, you say, Jesus, I believe in you. I make you the Lord of my life. Help me. Thank you for forgiving of my sins. There's no magic formula to this. And it's more of posture of your heart. And then you say, Jesus, I place my trust in you. And as you do, trust that, that Jesus will all automatically, probably taking steps towards you before you even took a step towards Jesus, starting to change you from the inside out. And change what you want, change your thoughts. Toward, and reorient you towards Christ's kingdom, which is reality, the real reality, the way things are meant to be. And let's see what happens. So let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we point our hearts towards you. We confess we need your help. We make you, again, the Lord of our lives. Will you please fill us with your spirit? Lord Jesus, give us the courage to follow you. And as we do, may we experience the comfort that comes from knowing that you will never leave us and never forsake us. For everyone that's watching this, whether it's on Easter Sunday or even years later, may they feel your presence right now tangibly, healing them, comforting them, and filling them with your hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. You are loved, and until we're together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.